So, and we have a great topic today. So why don't we go ahead and get started? So again, welcome everyone. I'm Arne van Alstertjord and I'm the global head of the KCS Academy. And I'm pleased to introduce Laurence Alicia and Christina Rusin from Akamai. And Laurence is the knowledge domain expert and Christina is the community program manager. And uh, Laurence and Christina will show how Akamai's KDEs use information about the use of the knowledge uh, base to improve it. And so a lot of exciting topics. We uh, went through it yesterday. It's a great presentation, so really looking forward to it. And just some housekeeping before we begin. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the consortium site for members, as well as sent out to all who registered. And they were kind enough to also um, will post the presentation. So we'll give you a PDF of that. And then um, please post your questions in chat. So if you can keep yourself on mute, uh, but post your questions in chat. And Monique Kadina, Akamai's KCS program manager is gonna be monitoring the chat. So pleased to have her on also. And we're either gonna, she's gonna answer them in chat, um, bring them up to Laurence uh, or Christina as appropriate in the flow or save them for the Q and A at the end. And uh, we do have an upcoming KCS in action scheduled for April 7th and Padma Prasad from NetApp will share how they implemented a content strategy to maximize customer success. And Jennifer Mortcat, our community success manager is gonna post the link in chat. And it's always great to hear, we actually have several other uh, KCS in actions that we're just finalizing the dates and we'll get those on um, soon. But it's great to hear about any digital transformations happening in the broader community. And so when I say digital transformations, it could be a KCS, we have so many of those. Um, but if you're maximizing your community space, your uh, automated support, proactive support, intelligence warming. We'd love to hear about those. And it can be the successes, uh, any strategies and tips, um, as well as ditches that you've encountered and how others can avoid those. So if you'd like to present at a KCS in action, please reach out to me and we'll get you on the calendar. And I'll post my um, contact information in chat shortly. But I'm very excited about today's event and pleased to pass it over to the ACMI team. Great, thanks. Go ahead, Laurence, and I'll start with your introduction. Sure, um, so hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Laurence Lechia. I'm a knowledge domain expert at Akamai. I've been at Akamai since 2010, uh, started as a technical support engineer, so level one, you know, frontline support. Uh, became a tier two, or what we call product support engineer about four years later. And for the past two years, uh, in addition to my tier two responsibility, I've also been a product line expert. So what my current role really means is to be a liaison between our support team, product management team and engineering team to make sure that support issue are resolved. And then long-term problems are also addressed. And I also work closely with these teams when new products or new features come out to make sure that there's a viable supportability plan. Training is also available for our frontline support team. So some of that aspect of my job involves KCS and also KD activities. Back to you, Christina. Great, thanks. So I'm Christina Rosen. I'm the program manager for the Akamai customer community. I've been with Akamai for about two and a half years and prior to that, I spent more than 20 years in various support operations roles, focusing on process improvement and training, business intelligence for sure, and community management. So here's a quick summary of what we're going to cover today. Laurence is going to give an overview of Akamai's KDE program, the types of things our KDEs work on, and then do a deeper dive into some of her specific activities. I'm going to talk about how our KDEs leverage data from the community which includes customer facing knowledge because that's where we host it. And I'll wrap up with a quick discussion of using customer self-service data to demonstrate the value of your KDE activities. And then we'll have some Q&A. So with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Laurence for her KDE presentation. Thanks, Christina. All right. Um, so first I um, wanted to give you a quick timeline about our KCS journey. So 2017 is when we started our real attempt at implementing KCS. Uh, we call it a reboot here, 
because it was really a third attempt at knowledge management. Uh, we had a knowledge base, we've had a knowledge base prior to that, we've had it for many, many years. And the, more, uh, the most recent years, we had implemented a system that had some aspect of KCS, but 2017 is really our first attempt at implementing 100% of the KCS methodology. Uh, so after we did that, uh, two years later, we started thinking about implementing the KD program, and that looked like a right time to do this uh, in implementing the KD role because we were at that point pretty confident in our implementation and our grasp of the salt loop. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about the, some of the things we're doing as part of that uh, KD program, what we've learned, and then some of the few also mistakes that we've made along the way. Um, but before, uh, just wanted to get uh, to give an idea of the size, number of people involved uh, in our support team. So we have a little over 450 technical support engineers, 35 are product support engineers. We're all spread out across the globe. Uh, the majority of our product support engineer, and I hope when I use that term, I mean tier two, that everybody's familiar with that term. Uh, so 35 of our product support engineer are also kiddies. And the one who are not, and those are usually the more recent or newer member of the team, are at least KCS coaches and on their way to becoming KD. Uh, the KD uh, lead uh, that are shown here in that slide really are more act more as a point of contact for each GO. So they're not meant to be coaches. Also, they can also act one, but their role is more of an anchor for the KD within that geolocation, somebody they can they can roll up to. All right, so what does it mean to be a KD at Akamai? Um, I think everybody's familiar with the concept and the term. So each of us has an expertise in usually one, sometimes two domain. And our responsibility is really to ensure that the knowledge is documented as best as, as, best as we can in our knowledge base, and as well as to promote, maybe sometimes remind some people of the KCS principles. So uh, in that sense, we're acting a bit as uh, super coaches. Uh, so this is a, an old picture of me and some of my team members receiving our KD certificate. Um, I can't remember the year, a long time ago. Those were some proud moments we had. All right. So when we talk about KD activity, uh, I think it's important to mention that Keeping with the KCS philosophy of not putting goals on activities, we do not set goals on these individual KD activities either. Uh, each KD is free to perform the activity that they see fit at the moment in time. Uh, what we do is evaluate the global contribution of all the KDs and look at trend and activities performed, uh, but again, as a whole, not at the individual level. So we've identified these activities in 10 buckets and some of the descriptions are probably, you know, things you've heard uh, before and you're familiar with. Uh, so we're talking about content gap analysis, domain curation, KCS council participation, problem management. So overall, we're keeping in line with the continuous improvement idea of the KCS process. Uh, so one of the important points I'm trying to make here is we do not force any specific activity. Um, but that being said, there is an expectation, right, that KDs will tackle at least one of these every quarter. All right. So a typical week in the world of, uh, of a KD, uh, well, there's of course no such thing. So for instance, we might spend time on one individual uh, escalation. Uh, right, our, our primary role is still tier two product support engineer. So we are here to assist our level one or tier one uh, frontline folks. Um, but in the within the KDE context, the activities will involve maybe reviewing a single article that touches on that issue, guide the TSC through troubleshooting step. So again, in that sense, we're more acting as a coach. On the other hand, um, a KDE will, decide to focus and spend maybe many hours, sometimes days, performing deep dive analysis on articles on a single domain. And that's what we usually refer to as sprint. 
Um, but before we dig a little deeper into those KD activities, so I've been asked why I enjoy working on knowledge management, why I tend to get more involved than other in this particular area. Um, I, I don't have the magic answer, unfortunately, but I guess part of it is uh, kind of related to my personality. I like things, you know, clean and organized and easily accessible. Um, the second is I don't really like answering the same question over and over, and I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody would agree with that. Um, and especially having worked at the same company for 12 years, I do I do get that a lot. Uh, so that's not my favorite part of the job. Being able to point somebody to an article that answers their question just makes that job a little bit easier. And finally, you know, I'm 100% on board with the idea that one person should not be the only person to know something, right? So the whole sharing is caring concept, um, I like that idea. All right, so we can dig into the actual activities now. Uh, so we can talk about dashboards. Um, I just wanted to mention before I get started, our case management, knowledge management application is Salesforce, if anybody's wondering. So as we know, assessing the value, the quality of the knowledge, right, is kind of the holy grail. Doing that is not easy. Uh, we can collect data about number of article created, number of attached, uh, content standard checklist, and so on. But quantifying that quality is really what we're aiming to do. Um, so among other things, one thing I've created is this dashboard to get a sense of what are the trend? Uh, how is the content generated? Who is generating it? Um, I want to first emphasize, so we do not use this as a mean of ranking or scoring people, right? This is purely informational. I don't share this dashboard with managers. Um, again, just, just trying to get an overview, an idea of what's going on. Uh, so that first column, it gives us a uh, by month, the number of edited article, newly published and archived article. So for that, from there, we can see trends in content creation. So are there month when there's an increase and decrease in newly created article uh, or month when edits are on the rise or archive, you, you get the idea. Uh, so for, from here, you can see, for instance, uh, the month of July, there was a big spike in archiving and that I would be the cause of that, uh, which brings us to kind of our mistake number one, that when we launched KCS back in 2017, uh, we decided to keep all of our old content. Uh, these are articles that for some could date back to 2015, even I'm afraid to admit, maybe even earlier than that. Uh, this means that we have a lot of old and potentially outdated content. So I periodically go over that. And um, in a lot of cases, those, those guys get archived. The, the second column shows, uh, this is a 12 month rolling window um, where we assess uh, the editors and the first time creator, the archivers of our content. So while we, again, right now do not put goals on this activity, we did make Mistake number two uh, was to enforcing these goals when we first rolled out KCS. Um, and while we've noticed that, you know, um, while we know that right now TSCs are not required to hit these numbers, uh, that habit is still a little bit hard to break. So looking at, for instance, the second, uh, the second report here in that column, uh, we can see that there's a number of people who tend to create new content um, on a higher scale than, than other folks. Uh, so we might want to go, for instance, one of the action we can take is go and have a little chat with these people and trying to understand why their um, the amount of newly published content is to be a little bit unusually higher than, uh, than the rest. On the flip side, I don't show it on this dashboard, but on the flip side, we could look sort of at the bottom of that um, content creator and also have, you know, have a chat with these people. Uh, no pressure though. The, uh, the final column here, it focuses on drafts. Uh, so I do like to keep an eye on drafts and remind folks every quarter or so that they have drafts that might be a few months old, kind of nudge them to either delete or finish writing the article. I think that 
while we would all love to think that everyone follows the KCS methodology to the letter, the reality is that it's, it's not always the case. Uh, not to say that it's obviously intentional, uh, it's simply, you know, the, gate get, the day gets through and creating, updating that article is not always thought of as a priority. So we're still working on making people's mind evolve that, you know, that whole KCS is not something we do in addition of your job. It's the way you do your job. Um, so I like to go and, uh, and talk to people and, and nudge them again to take another look. All right. Now for the next activity. Um, so another one I wanted to go over is a domain curation. Uh, and domain curation is really an umbrella term that we use to capture activity that address the health of articles and really the knowledge base as a whole. Uh, so we're talking about updating some terms when you have a product name change, for instance, coming up with an archiving strategy, um, merging of duplicate content and creation of hub articles. Uh, in practical term, what this means to me and how I approach it is with reports. Uh, so I create these reports again, Salesforce, right? And these are pretty simple article. Um, by that, I mean that the report um, are created using a, a, a singular search term or maybe a short string within the subject or the summary of that article. Uh, not everything, you know, has to be fancy dashboards. They're, they're nice, uh, but these particular reports are meant to be immediately actionable. So I also want to keep them simple. So for the update, uh, we create this type of report when we have, like I mentioned, a product name change. Uh, which happens, unfortunately, more often than we'd like, right? So the filter will be on the old product name, and we group it by audience and sort by descending cat case attached. Uh, we always, would, the reason we do that is because we want to tackle the most impactful article first. Uh, and these mean, and that means usually our, your external article with the most case attached. Um, internally, when you have when we have a product name change, it's not a huge deal. People internally know that uh, whether an article that they're looking at applies to their issue, even if the old name is mentioned. So we want to address those articles that are exposed to customer. Um, it's really a matter of confidence. Customer might be familiar with our product line. Um, our, they might be familiar enough with our product line to know the old name of a product, but really the question is, is what impression does having that content give out? So for instance, we changed the name of our customer portal from Luna Control Center uh, to just Control Center back in 2019. Uh, so have, we still have out there a few articles that mention Luna, and that ha can have one of two negative effects. One is assuming that the customer knows what Luna was, they may question whether they should trust this article that still references a term that we supposedly dropped three years ago. And two, if this is a newer customer, they might just have no idea what Luna even refers to. Um, <clears throat> So you might think that this is a lot of manual work that kind of goes against the KCS principle. Uh, that's not untrue. And this particular example I mentioned uh, where we just, we, we just dropped one term from that product name uh, should not impact our search algorithm so much. Uh, but you have to think about it in terms of uh, if, if you change your product name to a term that's just not remotely close to your old one, right? Uh, you have a lot of article that will no longer show up during a search. So this is a necessary analysis and cleanup activity uh, that we, we do. I blame marketing for that one, but you know. Uh, so we don't set any kind of a deadline, by the way, on, uh, on these particular type of activities, um, any, any, of the, any of the four. Uh, the next kind of sub activity within the domain curation is archiving. Uh, and that usually will happen when you have a product or a feature decommissioning. So in our case, we decommissioned our SOAP and REST API some time ago. Uh, the process would be very similar, right? So I'm not gonna go back over that, but we would create a report with using the SOAP API REST API search term. 
obviously the things that changes here is that instead of editing, we will be archiving articles. Uh, the process itself is a lot faster than editing. For me though, uh, and this is more because of a feature miss in Salesforce, I think um, when we archive an article, it just, that's it, right? It gets archived. So I like to edit the article and add a little note. We have this field called publishing note. Uh, so I'll add a date and why am I why I'm archiving that article and then republish it and then archive it. Uh, you could as easily obviously look at the article and then uh, you know click that button. Uh, I just choose, and, and I think a lot of KDEs within our team actually uh, do the same thing, but I choose to do, take that little extra step. On the, uh, so still uh, on the archiving strategy, um, you could use, uh, what we do is use an age and usage based logic. So for this, we don't care about domain, keywords, topic or anything. We're purely looking for articles that have a low attach and that were last edited more than X number of years ago. So the number of attached and the number of years will really depend on your environment. Um, when I created this report, I took, um, I was being very, I think, conservative. So for us, that meant an attached that was of one or even zero. Unfortunately, we do have some articles that have zero attached. Uh, and then four years since their last edit. So when we review that, it doesn't mean that every single one of these articles is archived. To be fair, yes, most of them are, um, but we still take the time to manually review those. Um, I did mention earlier that when we moved over to KCS, uh, we migrated all of our content. So another kind of on the same line, on the same idea of the age, um, there is also a secondary report where we look at these articles that ha basically have not been touched since the migration. Um, so these are articles, again, that are you know years enough old, um, but that have not been updated since that. So that's another kind of manual review. The, uh, the third kind of activity is reviewing of the duplicate content and the content overlap. Um, so the approach, the approach for this is really different because there's no report that can give you uh, the list of duplicated content, just like that. Um, the way we usually identify that duplicated content is that we kind of stumble upon it. Uh, so it's either because within our cap capacity as tier two, we're working on a specific issue and a KB search brings up multiple articles, uh, which we identify as duplicate. And then another one is just you, ha you have these moments, right, where you search for an article because you know this particular one exists. Um, and then, you know, you have two or three more that pop up along the same line. So there's really two courses of action that we can take when that happened. We just either do it ourselves, merge the content ourselves, or kind of use it as a, 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 like a little coaching session and then flag the author of the most recent content and ask that they fix the content themselves. Um, the last sub activity um, is the, is the creation of hub articles. So the purpose of a hub article is really to display in one place, the collection of articles about a specific topic. Uh, and these are useful in order to visualize really articles that exist on a topic and, organ, and organize them in a manner that matters, that makes sense as well. Um, it's hard to gauge the value of a hub article because at Akamai, at least, we really discourage the attaching of hub article. Um, so we're able to track their usage and their views. Um, but again, there's the sense of they should not be used as, uh, as, as attached articles. All right. Thank you, Christina. All right, so the next activity I wanted to go over is the knowledge-based driven problem management. Uh, problem management, you're probably all familiar with that, is the you know, analysis usually of cases to determine a strategy to reduce cases, 
uh, enable better self-serviceability and also something we use to drive product improvement. Right, so in the context of KCS, we're applying this analysis to the article usage uh, or the article attach. So simply put, that means um, we are looking for the top article attached to cases. So once we have that information, we can now determine what are the most asked questions, uh, what are the most common issues raised, and therefore decide what the next, the logical next step is. Uh, what we found out is for this to really work well, uh, it is really crucial to assign the correct template to your article. So these are, you know, problem solution, your Q&A, your how-tos, which in our case, uh, these are the three that we decided to define as part of our content standard. The report itself is not, you know, complicated or hard to generate, and the screenshot here in that slide on the right uh, shows an example of what the result looked like for us. So I filtered here, I filtered on cases op open for our uh, customer portal, um, because control center, again, our portal is my domain of expertise, so that's, that's what I tend to focus on. And then I asked Salesforce to give me just a count of the most attached article to these cases. Um, the try time frame here is 60 days. Obviously, that is uh, not necessarily an arbitrary uh, number I chose, but it's really up to you to decide how far back you want to, to go. So when we, we have that, uh, the next action, uh, and by that I mean, you know, which team do I go to next about this particular issue can kind of go in one of three directions. Uh, the most obvious one is bugs, right? So something is broken. Uh, internally, we use JIRA as our escalation um, issue tracker. So I would open a JIRA with the appropriate team, and that can be a product team, maybe an engineering team. And these usually map to problem solution type of cases, right? Uh, the second one, second one is uh, we identify an improvement that we can make, and it can be an improvement to our, you know, user guide or kind of more official documentation. Uh, it is also maybe we identify that a customer facing tool could have been useful. Um, again, the escalation would go through JIRA, but the type of uh, articles that we identify would use more of the Q&A uh, template. So what is X, Y, Z, why is this happening? The how to why are not Q&A, um, but that brings us to our last bucket, which are the how to's. Uh, so these are more procedural articles that customer or internal folks can follow to help them in, in setting something up, uh, troubleshooting an issue. Um, so, for instance, a customer gets an alert. What you know? What steps can they can they take to identify the cause? Um, because there's a lot of content that we, the support team, can publish quickly and easily. Um, at least more quickly and more easily than our tech writer, it's really vital that we get the information in front of customers. So we have control over that information and it is up to us and it's our responsibility to really manage that properly. Uh, so these, the way you know we categorize this, it's, it's not black and white, obviously there's some overlap, uh, not an exact science, but using these bucketing, uh, that kind of bucketing method and, and using the uh, article template type uh, really helps and it's a great guide to help out in this process. Um, if you wanted more information about our problem management, you can check the video from, uh, I think it was about a year ago, Pauline and Satish presented about our KCS uh, driven problem management project. All right. So to wrap things up, um, so what we identify, you know, what is important for the to the success of KDE at Akamai. Um, I think one of them is that we identified the activities uh, that, can, that KDEs can really pick from. We don't force or ban KDEs to any of these activities. Um, that said that, you know, there's still an expectation that we will perform one, uh, at least one of these during a quarter, uh, but we're really given the freedom to explore and try things and tinker with reports. Um, and then dashboards. Some of these reports dashboard uh, that we can uh, use to understand and identify actions to take. Um, 
And then finally, the measure of our contribution is done at a global, at a team level, not individually. So I think these are the big three takeaways that uh, that makes us successful um, as KDs at Akamai. And with that, I am going to hand it over to Christina to talk about how we leverage self-service and community data. Thanks, Laurence. You know, our KDEs are such an impressive group of experts, and their passion for KCS is one of the cornerstones of our practice at Akamai. But I'm going to shift our focus slightly to talk about self-service data and our KDEs. So our customer community, like most community sites, is where we encourage our users to collaborate and ask questions of each other. But it's also the same site where they access our knowledge base. And at Akamai, not only the site, but the KCS and community program managers are part of the same team. So we work very closely together on strategy, objectives, projects, and one of those things is empowering our KDEs with information from the community. So why should you think about self-service and community data when you think about KCS? Um, I'd argue that outside of a one-on-one -on -one interaction like a chat or a support case, community activities and customer usage of your knowledge is the most direct contact that your customers have with you in a support environment. That point of engagement can provide you with a lot of data and you wanna make sure you're taking advantage of it. And when I think about that data, I generally categorize it into two buckets. Uh, direct feedback is what most people think of right away, right? This is asking our, quest our customers to rate an article or fill out a feedback form or participate in a survey. That's good data. Indirect feedback is a little bit different. Um, it's based on observation and interpretation of customer behavior. It's like wildlife observation. It requires a little more analysis work but it covers a broader range of users than just those who volunteer feedback. Direct feedback often represents a very small percentage of your users. And generally it's only those with very strong opinions, kind of like restaurant rating sites, right? Uh, strong opinions and a lot of times slanted towards the negative. So for every user who gives you a glowing or terrible review, there are many, many users out there who had a neutral to good experience and never bothered to tell you about it. We don't wanna leave those users out entirely. So we interpret information about their behavior as feedback. Before I dive into some specific examples of how we use data, uh, I thought it might be helpful to talk a little bit about our architecture since it does influence the data we have available and gives a little bit of context to the examples I'm gonna show you. So as Laurence has already mentioned, we use Salesforce specifically Salesforce Service Cloud for our case management and knowledge processes and Experience Cloud for our customer community. This means that we can report out of Salesforce on knowledge, case data, including article attachments to cases and community activity. It's all available there in Salesforce reporting. I do wanna take a quick mention here because I'm a little bit of a reporting head. Uh, if you're a Salesforce user like we are, you may have run into some limitations with standard Salesforce reporting when you try to do some more complex analysis, and you might find it necessary to use a more sophisticated tool. Uh, for example, we pull Salesforce data into an enterprise data warehouse so that we can use other business intelligence tools against it. I'm not gonna show you any examples of that in this presentation, but keep in mind, you may want to extend beyond the reporting that Salesforce gives you out of the box, which is robust and easy to use, but doesn't give you sometimes all of the level of detail you need. Anyway, in addition to Salesforce reporting, uh, to report on web activity, we have Google Analytics connected to our community. And we've installed a package from Salesforce into our Google Analytics account that provides us with a little extra information, like whether the community activity is coming from an unauthenticated or guest user, um, an authenticated customer, or an internal user. So that, for example, helps me filter specifically just for the users I want to observe. We also use Google Data Studio to turn Google Analytics data into custom dashboards that we can share with the entire organization. It can be useful to everyone. Right now, uh, the, we're using Salesforce native search in our community, the kind of built-in community search. So some of my search data today comes from Salesforce reporting, and it's a little bit limited. 
but we're in the process of deploying a unified search tool and I'm really looking forward to getting more data from that tool about search. So your environment and tool set won't look like ours. No two environments are completely alike, but chances are you have at least a, a similar set of data available to you. And if you're not using that data now, I hope that you have a little bit better idea of where you might get that data. And I'll show you next how we use information like that. So search analysis or gap analysis is probably the most widely performed and well-known of these activities. It's no doubt gonna be very familiar to all of you who use data from searches to identify gaps in your knowledge content. Right now, as I mentioned, we're using the out-of-the-box Salesforce community search. So we get search term and success data from there, but it is somewhat limited both in what's available and even in the kind of time scope. So we use Google Analytics data for search results as well. Uh, it ha so happens in the community, in a Salesforce community, the URL for a search results page includes the search string that they used. So we use reporting tools to kind of parse that out and report on it. And this lets us break down searches using the other demographic data available in Google Analytics, like user type or uh, browser language or geography. It also happens to let me look farther back in time than is currently allowed by my Salesforce reporting. So we use this data for search engine optimization to track popular terms and ensure the content returned is fresh, uh, to identify new terms that customers may be using, to, uh, to make sure our knowledge remains in the customer's context and to look for maybe new or emerging terms to proactively publish knowledge to meet incoming demand. Another side note, if you're using Google Search Console for Google Analytics, you can actually dive into what Google search terms directed users to your site, so you can incorporate that data as well. But I'll give you a little heads up, uh, the increasingly strict data privacy laws going into effect around the globe may limit what you can implement in Google Analytics. It does with our environment. So it's always a good idea to check in with your data privacy or legal or security team to make sure you're permitted to collect and use this data before you start launching a project like this. So our community is a support focused community. Members come there because they have a question or, they, or an issue they want resolved. And we think about this type of self-service engagement much like you would think about a support case. It's incoming demand for a solution, and that solution could be known or new, just like a case. Right? If it's known, we hope the customer finds an answer published in the knowledge base. If it's new, they can ask a question right there on the community in that same site. So our community engagement team is the same technical team that responds to chat requests. And one of the things they do when working on unanswered questions in the community is to first try to point users to known answers. So they search early and often just like they would when solving a case. And if the question is determined to be a new one, they not only provide an answer to that community user, but they create a new knowledge uh, article about that answer. That engagement team also includes KDEs who analyze community conversations. They may use information from community discussions to identify new or underserved keywords, to leverage how questions are asked, to make sure our knowledge stays in the customer context. There's no better customer context than something the customer typed themselves into a community. For conversations where customers provide each other with answers, which is kind of your community nirvana, um, the KDE looks for opportunities to create knowledge from those peer-to-peer -peer conversations as well. The process of harvesting peer-to-peer -peer discussions has an extra benefit. It can also be incorporated back into your community to encourage users to provide answers. Recognition of expertise is a very strong motivator for some community members, especially in a technical community. If you do source a knowledge article from an external user's answer, I would suggest including an attribution in the article if you can, and adding a comment to the conversation, thanking the user and pointing to the new article. If you're worried about using a customer's content without getting explicit permission from the user, um, because there's, there would be overhead incurred, right, in like reaching out to them, can we use your content? Yes, you may or no, you may not. Most community terms of service cover this usage. 
Um, if yours doesn't, consider adding a clause to it before you launch a project like that. A popular article analysis. So evaluating articles based on attachment to cases is very valuable. And that's something Laurence dove into in detail. One thing it doesn't capture, article attach, is whether articles were useful to people who never opened a case. That's where community data comes in again. Our knowledge-based reporting out of Salesforce does provide us article vote activity. This is valuable. But remember, that's only a very small percentage of your audience. Salesforce, like most knowledge platforms, provides view statistics by article. One thing that's important to remember is that it doesn't provide a way to filter out activity from automated tools like bots if you have public content, which we do. So we incorporate Google Analytics data here too, since you can exclude known bots and spiders from your data. We rank article URLs by page view and then use that for improvement efforts. We wanna make sure that content that's getting lots of eyes in the community is up to date. We wanna look at it to see if we can determine what makes it so popular. Like maybe it's got great use of keywords. Maybe people are coming there directly because the link is being shared or it's being discovered in organic search, like a Google search. The article could be a candidate for our KB driven problem management activities based on its popularity. The article might even be worth promoting or featuring within the community experience, like highlighting on the homepage, for example. All good ways to use that information. So those were only a few examples of how KDEs can use self-service data. This is just a few more to mention briefly. Um, behavior data is available in Google Analytics, as well as many other web analysis tools. It lets you do clickstream analysis so you can observe patterns in your user navigation. You could you know, optimize paths to knowledge, uh, identify articles where users searched again after viewing, or identify cap gaps in content by analyzing the path of users who looked at knowledge, but went on to create a support case if you can capture that path. For your direct feedback, um, make sure you're using all of the context that's available to you. We're launching a new feedback mechanism in the upcoming year. We're actually planning to use a combination of the feedback the customer submits and data we're gathering kind of in the background about who the user is, because they're an authenticated user, where they were when they provided the survey response, the URL when they answered the survey, and we'll use that to kind of improve content across the site, including the experience and any knowledge articles that get feedback. And lastly, page view data about a single article can be useful for housekeeping. Just like we looked at our most popular articles, we can look at articles with very low view activity or activity that has significantly declined over time. So we can make smart decisions about archiving. Laurence talked about her archiving, you know, based on low attach rate. Before we do, if that article that you're thinking about archiving due to low attach rate is externally facing, you can check the URL and see if anybody's looking at it and getting value from it. And if they're not looking at it in the community either, it's pretty safe to archive. The last thing I wanna to touch on um, is measurements. It's always a popular topic. Self-service data is very useful when you wanna demonstrate the value of KDE activities if you're exposing your KCS content to customers. We all know, and we've heard time and time again in almost every webinar about you know, the support technologies, more customers every day look for their answers online before they reach out to support. And we know that the self-service channel is valuable both to those customers as a quick way to get answers and to the business as a cost-effective way of meeting support demand. One way to show the impact of your continuous improvement efforts is to trend your self-service over time and then plot your activities on the timeline to see if you can observe impact. In this example graph here, uh, there were two knowledge improvement sprints undertaken and they resulted in an immediate increase in article page views as seen on the activity trend line. This is a very rosy picture. This type of vis visualization is not only helpful in proving value to the business, but it's a great way to show KDEs the impact they're making, right? Some things to keep in mind if you're planning to incorporate this type of data. First of all, don't set 
goals based on volume, just like we don't set goals based on activity. You're not trying to hit some magic number of page views or self-service engagements to say you did well. What you're doing is trending against yourself and observing and celebrating improvements. Not every picture is going to be this clear. This is a, a lovely mock-up graph, but chances are you've got more going on than KDE activity that can influence your self-service numbers. Context is always important when it comes to measurements. And I would argue it's especially important here where data comes from the behavior of your customers, which can be influenced by any number of factors, some of which are under your control, you know, like product releases or sprints of improvement, and some not, right? Like a pandemic, perhaps. For example, if you're launching a big new initiative, um, a KDE activity that's you're looking to improve self-service adoption in late November, you may not immediately see an increase in activity because of the end of your holidays, right? So for some great information about measuring self-service and a lot more of these uh, types of discussions, uh, I would refer you to Understanding Success by Channel in the Consortium Library. This ongoing project is digging into all of this type of value measurement and pulling out some really good information. So to sum up for me, information about the external usage of your knowledge base can provide a wealth of insight. When you're looking at incorporating that data into your continuous improvement efforts, make sure you're not limiting yourself to direct feedback like votes or surveys. Use that indirect or inferred feedback to get a broader view of what your users are doing. Remember, there are many ways to use this information. They'll be specific to your environment. And some of the best ideas for using self-service data will come from your KDEs. So include them and all their expertise and creativity in this process. And finally, ensure ongoing investment in your KDE activities by providing a view of the value you're creating in as simple a way as you can. And with that, I think we're ready to open things up for questions. I know there's a lot from chat. We've got just over 10 minutes to go. So Christina, there were, there were some um, questions specific to uh, Salesforce I was not able to answer. Um, okay. You mentioned a package to, um, for one of the reports that you were using. Yeah, I can't remember the exact name of it. If you search, if you do a Google search for sales, uh, Salesforce for Google Analytics, there's a little um, free installation, a free add-on to Google Analytics. And it, it lets you, you have to be careful with data in Google Analytics as far as, you know, like IP anonymization and things, but it will at least tell you what kind of Salesforce license the web visitor is using, which is like guest customer internal. It lets us, for example, like filter out internal people coming to our community. So Salesforce for Google Analytics, the Google search should get you that package. And then someone wanted to know also, um, are you finding that people who come to the community and are searching for knowledge, are they more inclined to consume the community threads as well? We do have a lot of overlap with visitors looking at discussions and knowledge. And in fact, our community kind of presents both of those things. If you search, if, if you look at a page about a product, or you search for a product name, the community is arranged by topic. And if you click on that topic, you'll get knowledge and discussions for that topic on the same page. So we do have quite a lot of overlap. And in fact, we're actually moving our case management application this year very soon into the community as well. So it'll be kind of a one-stop shop for answers. And we'll be suggesting, you know, it's pretty common when you open a, new, a support case that they suggest content to you. A lot of times that content is knowledge articles. We'll be suggesting articles and discussions with answers. So I think we answered everything in the chat. There were a lot of questions coming in pretty fast, but if we didn't get to any, um, Feel free to come off of mute and ask your question. And also while you are um, coming off mute and thinking about your questions, um, Sarah, do you wanna just talk about uh, the links you posted? Just give a little overview of that. And Sarah is our 
uh, Director of Member Engagement at the consortium. Hi, yes, uh, we have a post already up on LinkedIn or Twitter with the presentation information and feel free to pop over there and uh, continue to connect with each other, share your takeaways or uh, ask questions that maybe pop into your mind a bit later. And we'll be following that and following up with you. And, and would like to highlight, you probably saw this, but uh, um, Kelly Murray, uh, our chief engagement officer has posted a lot of great uh, links to valuable resources on the consortium site. So please take advantage of those. All right. Well, it does not look like it. And again, with all the great, uh, great questions in chat, but uh, great work by Monique and Ronz and everybody in answering those. So we want to thank you all so much. And again, um, if you want to continue the conversation, we're going to send out the recording as well as um, a PDF of the presentation. So as you're reviewing it, if you do have any questions, uh, please uh, take advantage of the LinkedIn and Twitter um, for links that uh, Sarah put up for continuing the conversation. But I want to thank uh, the Akamai team, really appreciate it. That was a great topic and very, very informative. So thank you all very much. And we'll wrap it up here then. And everyone have a great rest of the day. <laughs>